All right, Colossians chapter 1. So we've spent the past several months looking at the glorious supremacy of Christ over all things, and we've done it from the latter half of Colossians chapter 1. And it's vital for Christians to do this because understanding the glorious supremacy of Christ is the key to every Christian's growth in Christ. And so we've seen his supremacy as God. Christ is the image of the invisible God. It pleased God for all his fullness to dwell in Christ. He's the full disclosure of God to man, and there is no knowing God apart from knowing Jesus Christ. We've seen his supremacy as creator. He is the firstborn of all creation, holding the place of highest rank and greatest honor. By him, all things were created. So he is the uncreated creator, through whom and for whom are all things. They were made for him, they were, um, and to whom all things are therefore subject. We see his, we've seen his supremacy over the church. He is the head of the body, the church. He is both the origin and the destiny of the church, and the one to whom the church willingly and gladly submits as her Lord, her Savior, and her Shepherd. And we've seen his supremacy over the dead. He is the firstborn from the dead. He again holds the place of highest honor, for by his death and resurrection, he gained absolute victory over sin and over death. And his death put death to death, and all who die in him will be raised to new life, just as he was. We then saw that because of Christ's supremacy over all things, that he is also sufficient to completely reconcile sinners to God and to save them forever. It was through Christ that God reconciled all things to himself, and that includes you and me. Paul says that Christ has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. He reconciled you in order to present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And those Christ saves, he saves forever because he changes their natures completely, completely through regeneration, through the new birth. And as a result, they continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. All right, so that's, that's marching all the way down to verse 23. So we've seen the glorious supremacy of Christ over all things. His absolute sufficiency of, to reconcile and save sinners forever. So what now? What difference should all this be making in our lives? Is it just good to know? So we can just, whoo, whoo, yay Jesus. Supreme and sufficient. Is that where it ends? How is seeing Christ in this way the key to our growth as Christians? And that's where Paul goes next. He shows how his entire life was completely transformed through his coming to know who Christ is, what he's done, what he is doing, what he's going to do. And now his entire life is about serving Christ. And the same thing will happen to you, Christian. If your life isn't utterly transformed by Christ, then you have reason to ask yourself if you truly know him. If you can say, oh, Jesus, you're, you're glorious in your supremacy over all things and your, and your sufficiency to reconcile sinners, but you're not willing to suffer for him. You're more willing to suffer for your politics than for, or for your favorite sports teams than for Christ's name or his gospel. Or you're more influenced by the influencers on social media than by Christ. Or you have more passion to get promoted at work than to proclaim his excellencies to anyone. See, it begs the question. Do you really know this supreme and sufficient one? Or are you just giving him lip service? So this week and next, we'll bring 
our journey here in just this latter half of Colossians 1 to a close, and we'll consider two effects in your life of seeing the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. Number one, you're compelled to serve him. Number two, you're constrained to proclaim him. First, we're going to look at serving Christ. So let's read our text, verses 24 to 27. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship of God, bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So from Paul's own life, we learn this, that seeing the glorious supremacy and the complete sufficiency of Christ, it compels you to serve his people joyfully and faithfully. See, seeing the glorious supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, it compels you to serve his people joyfully and faithfully. And so from this text, I've got four applications for you today. Share Christ's afflictions joyfully. Serve Christ's body faithfully. Declare Christ's glory powerfully. And preach Christ's hope confidently. So before we begin, let's ask the Lord's help. Lord God, it's you that we need to hear from this morning. And so may my words be your words. But we need to do more than just hear. We need to be changed. I need to be changed. Please, Lord, convict my heart for your people and for living in light of your glory. And let your words challenge, convict, and move the hearts of those who hear. Amen. Now, one way that your life changes from seeing the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. It's seen in what you are willing to enter into for the sake of the gospel. Suffering. Who is willing to enter into suffering for any reason? Maybe you would suffer on behalf of your child about to go through something and you step in the way. I'll take that. But see, when you see the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ, when you see who He is, not some idea, not some theology, you see Him, then you want to make Him known. You want His glory known. And if that leads to suffering, you'll say, I'll take it. I'll take it. He says this, beginning in verse 24, he says, this is Paul. I rejoice in my sufferings. For your sake, he's talking to the Colossians. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body. That would be the whole church. He says, which is the church. In filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So here we have our first application. Share Christ's afflictions joyfully. Share Christ's afflictions joyfully. Joyfully. This is what we are to do. This is an application. I'm giving it to you right up front. Share Christ's afflictions joyfully. See, when you enter into a relationship with Christ, it changes your life. See, on the one hand, you have, you have fellowship now with one who loved you. And he loved you even though you were a sinner. And he completely reconciled you to God through his death. But on the other hand, you're now aligned with the one whom the world hates and rejects because he testifies that their deeds are evil. And so you serve Christ because you love Christ, but in loving and serving Christ, you're also hated by the world and you will suffer persecution to the degree to which you live for Christ. See, no one experienced this dynamic reality more than the Apostle Paul. And so to learn how to share Christ's Afflictions joyfully, 
We have no better example than the Apostle Paul. Two things from Paul that will help us uh, that, that is that he was called to ministry by God's sovereign grace and he was sustained in... I'm sorry, let me say that. He was called to ministry by God's sovereign grace and he was sustained in ministry by God's saving grace. So we have his sovereign grace and his saving grace in view here. So one of the reasons that Paul could rejoice in his sufferings was because he knew that he had been called to ministry by God's sovereign grace. God made this abundantly clear to Paul when he dramatically saved him as he did that day when he was making his way to the city of Damascus. See, if you know the story of Paul, you know that serving Christ was not what he planned to do with his life, to put it mildly. On the contrary, at the time that God saved Paul, his goal was not to serve the church, it was to destroy the church. That was his goal. Paul was a Pharisee. He was zealous for God and for the traditions of Judaism. And his zeal led him to become a zealous persecutor of Christians. And we first come across Paul in the book of Acts at the stoning of Stephen, who was the first Christian martyr in the New Testament. He was known at that time by his Jewish name. He was Saul of Tarsus. And Acts chapter 7 describes him. It says, When they had driven Stephen out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. He was right there, cheering on the death of this Christian. Paul soon made a name for himself amongst both the Jews and the Christians. He was a self-motivated leader of the persecution of the early church. Anyone here want to persecute Christians? Saul would say, I'll do it. But I don't think he did it with spit coming out of his mouth. I think he was one of those, I will do it. You could just, his zeal drove him. I will crush these people who blaspheme the God of the Jews by saying some upstart young preacher is God. Luke captured Paul's zealous hatred in chapter 9, which is the chapter in Acts where it describes his conversion. It says, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women didn't matter if you were a man, woman, child, If you claim to be with Christ, he wanted to bring you bound back to Jerusalem. See, after his conversion to Christ, he he was now serving Christ, and he stood before King Agrippa. And this was Paul's own words about himself when he was, what he was doing at the time of Acts chapter 9. But this is in Acts chapter 22. So this is long after that, and he's looking back. And this is how he he described himself to to Agrippa. He said, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. See, if you were a Christian and Paul knew where to find you, look out. He would seek you out even if it involved traveling to foreign cities. If he got word that there were Christians in a city like Damascus, he'd go and say, give me papers so I can go to the synagogue and find them and bring them back here. And when he found you, this is what he would do. He would taunt you publicly in the synagogue because that's where Christians were still going to the synagogues. They didn't, they didn't quite know yet where to gather. It was still early. So they'd go to the synagogues like they always had. And when he sniffed you out, he would taunt you publicly until you said something about Jesus that would be considered blasphemous to the Jews. And then he would bind you, he would throw you in prison, he would prosecute you personally, and then he would demand the death penalty. And it was while Paul was on this one-man crusade to destroy the church that he was confronted personally by the risen Jesus. He was overwhelmed by what he described as a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around him. And then he heard a voice in Hebrew. 
right? Because he was a good Hebrew. And he knew, he knew how to speak Hebrew, unlike the Greek that everyone was speaking. So Jesus spoke to him in Hebrew and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this man who had struck fear into the hearts of others, it was now his turn to be fearful. Who, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Oh, just imagine what was going through Paul's mind. Confusion. Amazement. Disbelief. Comprehension. And then dread. It was true. It was true. This... This Jesus, these foolish Jews were following. He was not some backwoods, upstart, blasphemous, false Messiah. He was the Messiah. And he wasn't dead. Which means he had risen from the grave. Just as he said he would. Just as his followers were preaching. They were saying that they'd seen him alive from the dead. All the signs and wonders that they said he did. Turning water into wine. Giving sight to the blind. Making the lame walk. The blind see. Feeding multitudes. Walking on water. Raising the dead. He really did these things. And they all pointed to one thing. And now he knew it. He finally admitted it. He's God. He's God in the flesh. And so he is laying there before the risen Jesus and he knows what he deserves. He deserves death. The death that he was bringing upon the followers of Jesus, he deserves that death now. Oh, but not just death. Paul had aligned himself against God's servant. He wasn't only going to die, Paul was going to hell. But instead of the sentence of death for resisting God, Jesus forgave Paul. He saved Paul. And he did sentence Paul to something, but it wasn't death. He sentenced him to gospel ministry. He saved Paul by his sovereign grace. And then he called Paul to ministry by his sovereign authority. Jesus said to him, if you want to read it, it's in, it's in Acts 26. This is Paul's account again. Acts 26, in verse 16, Paul recalls what he heard Jesus said. Get up. Stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you've seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am now going to send you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from dominion of, and the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. This Hebrew of Hebrews was now going to be sent to the Gentiles so that they could be forgiven. All that zeal with which Paul had once persecuted Christ and the church out of hatred, it was transformed now to overwhelming love and gratitude that compelled him to serve Christ and his church. He deserved to die and he knew it. He deserved to be cast into hell for what he had done, but he was shown mercy and he was given grace. He tells us back in Colossians in verse 25, he says, he says, how that made him view his ministry now. It's a stewardship from God. The Lord Jesus Christ had entrusted this ministry to him. Paul knew what he deserved. So if he could suffer for the one who, would, who, who should have sent him to hell, Paul would gladly do it. Christ had bestowed this ministry on him for the benefit of his people. Those he had persecuted to death. Those he had sought to humiliate and destroy. And so Paul's genuine heartfelt response to Christ for this grace, thank you. Thank you for letting me serve. Thank you. Christian, do you realize 
Christ has spared you from what you deserved. This isn't just Paul we're talking about. This is every one of us here. You may not have been seeking the death of Christians, but do you think your sins are any less deserving of death and condemnation from God? If you do, you don't understand the gravity of your sin. You don't understand the magnitudes of, magnitude of God's glory and His holiness. The wages of sin is death. What gratitude should flood your soul for not getting what you deserve? What willingness should fill your heart to serve the one who has not only spared you, but has called you to serve Him? Do you realize that like Paul, you, you have been called, you have been commissioned to make disciples of Christ, to teach them all of His commands? Do you realize that His Spirit has sovereignly entrusted to you a spiritual enablement with which you are to faithfully and lovingly serve His church? And not only that, He has called you to love one another in such a way that He says, consider others as more important. There's a need. You don't say, well, I don't know if that's my gift. You say, how can I meet it? Why? Because I know what I deserve. I deserve death. I deserve condemnation, but God has spared me. He has shown grace to me. And if I can serve Him, I will do it with joy and with gratitude. Are you being obedient to that calling as Paul was obedient to His? But not only was Paul faithful to ministry, to the ministry that God had sovereignly called him to, he served the Lord with joy even when it led to his suffering. Paul wrote to the Colossians from a Roman prison. That's where this letter was penned from. And he says, I rejoice. His circumstances didn't rob him of his joy. Why? And this is the second point under sharing Christ's afflictions joyfully. It's because Paul was sustained in ministry by God's saving grace. He was called to ministry by his sovereign grace. He was sustained in ministry by his saving grace. Paul's joy was Christ himself. The knowledge of that he was not getting what he deserved. And this humility before God, it was the source of Paul's joy in whatever circumstances that he faced in ministry. He told the Philippians, he says, but even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, like my life, it's just, it's just a cup filled with sacrificial liquid, just pour me out, pour me out. And if that's what it is, I rejoice. I share my joy with you all. Can you see, what would compel him to say, is he just zealous? He's just, oh, well, that's just another category of Christian. Is that all this is? Paul refers to the physical suffering that he faced in his ministry. He says, in my flesh, my body, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, Paul refers here, to the afflictions that he faced. He calls them Christ's afflictions because they reflect the, the world's hatred for Christ. They hate Christ, they hate me. So if I'm suffering afflictions for Christ, it's like Christ's afflictions. The more faithfully we represent Christ to the world, the more the world will feel the same way about us that they feel about Christ. Paul says something similar to this in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. So Paul's reference here to filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, that language has led some people, some ministries, some denominations, some whole systems of belief to think that there is something meritorious in our sufferings. I'm speaking mainly of the Roman Catholic Church and its reference to purgatory. Christ, purgatory is a place where Christians are said to go after their death to make up their own, suf, uh, own suffering, what was lacking in Christ's afflictions. So they'll point to this verse and say, see, there's, it's, there's a lack, so you have to fill it up in purgatory. The Roman Catholic's teaching of purgatory is not biblical. The idea that our sufferings can in any way add to our salvation, that is not taught anywhere in Scripture. And it's certainly not to be found in the context of what Paul is talking about here in Colossians. The idea that we could do something meritorious, 
towards, sinner, uh, towards our salvation, even our own suffering, that would completely undermine Paul's argument about the sufficiency of Christ to reconcile sinners completely. Right? He just got done saying this up in verse 22. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. And if you remember what we covered there, this word reconciled, it's the regular word for reconciliation plus a prefix that intensifies the meaning. He's turning up the volume. Paul is saying Christ has now completely reconciled you by his death. To, to say that we still need to be purged of our sins, that's saying Christ's death was not enough. He wasn't sufficient. Paul would never say that. There's no room here to suggest that Christ's sufferings were in any way lacking. Our sufferings are not meritorious in any way. Our sufferings do not complement Christ's sufferings as he served Christ in his church. Jesus said to expect it if you're going to follow him. It's on the job description. Oh, you want to follow me? You know you're signing up for persecution. You know that, right? He says, in the world you have tribulation. He said in John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before you. So don't be surprised. What Paul shows us is that he didn't let circumstances or people or worrying about those things rob him of his joy in ministry. And the same is to be true for us. Christ can give you joy anywhere. Anywhere when you understand you're not getting what you deserve for your sin. And sadly, when we're facing some means of suffering, when something isn't going right, when something isn't going the way we want it to do, when people are responding to us in some way that we don't like, maybe it's because we're a Christian, we say something like, you know, I, I know I'm not getting what I deserve, but why would God let this happen to me? See, you'll only think this way because you think you deserve better. There's no humility there, and so there's no joy. You should be thinking, this suffering is nothing compared to what I deserve for my sin. Full stop. That's the end of it. Right there. No buts. You deserve to be condemned. You deserve to be cast away from the presence of God to suffer forever in hell. But God has spared you. He's made you alive when you were dead. He spared you by his grace and he suffered in your place. See, do you, do you lack joy in your life? It might be in ministry. It just might be in general. You just lack joy. Do you also lack joy in your ministry? You just serve. You just do it. You know what I can guess you might also lack? Humility. If you will choose to humble yourself under God's mighty hand, then he'll enable you to wait until God chooses to exalt you. Psalm 1611, it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. He doesn't qualify that. You say, if you're well, there's fullness of joy for you. If things are going well for you, if, if, all, if you have all the money in the bank that you need, there's fullness of joy for you. He just simply says it. In your presence is fullness of joy. That's joy whatever you're facing. In your right hand, there's pleasures forever for you in whatever circumstance you're facing. Christ can sustain you. He can give you fullness of joy through his presence. He gives you his joy. He gives you his peace. And it's unlike anything this world can give you. It's going to sustain you. And it's going to sustain you through anything that you face in this life. As you faithfully and as you humbly serve him. And that leads us now to our second application. Like Paul, we are to serve Christ's body faithfully. He says in verse 25, Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. So Paul was given a special ministry to fulfill, which he was then driven, compelled to fulfill. And he refers to it here, he calls it a stewardship from God. So a steward was someone who was hired to manage another's property, his household. And so God made Paul a steward over the church, which Paul calls, in 1 Timothy, he calls it the household of God. So he saw himself 
Because God gave them this ministry as a steward over the household of God, the church. So this is a unique role. None of you and I can say this about ourselves. I am not the steward of the church. I'm, the, I'm a steward of this church in a sense. But Paul understood his ministry was unique. Now, there's something I want to point out. The New American Standard makes it sound like his stewardship here is the preaching of the word. And he says it, if you look there in verse 25, he says that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. However, if you have the New American Standard, the word preaching is in what? Italics. Do you see that? That means that it's not in the Greek. It means those who are translating this looked at the whole picture and said, we think he's talking about the preaching of the word here. And they're not, I wouldn't say they're wrong. I, you know, that's, that's in view, but I don't think that's what he's getting at here. So I think it's not wrong, but it misses the mark. The context of what Paul is talking about here is not preaching. He's talking about new revelation. And I think the ESV actually does a better job. So if you have the ESV, this is the way it reads. I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. So it's that idea of making the word fully known that they took back and said, well, that means he means preaching. I don't think that's what he means. Yes, he's going to preach it, but that's not what he's talking about. And from the next verse, we see that Paul, what he has in mind here, the mystery of the gospel, which he says in verse 26, he says, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been made manifest, has been manifested to his saints. Okay, so mystery, we've said this many times, but just to repeat it, mystery is not a murder mystery. Who did it? Mystery in the Bible is truth that has yet to be revealed. And he's saying, this mystery, which is the gospel, it's time to reveal it. The full, and guess who's tasked with doing that? The apostles. And Paul is mentioning, I'm, I'm a part of that stewardship. This is my job. I've got to reveal this mystery. God's revealing it, and now it's to be proclaimed. So God gave to Paul, he gave to the other apostles, the unique task of receiving the revelation that would complete God's revelation to man in written form. We're talking about the scriptures here. They were to write it down. And it was to be recognized as Scripture on par with the Scriptures that God had already given through the Law and the Prophets. In other words, the Older Testament. They're going to be writing the New Testament, and it's going to be on par with the Older Testament, the bigger section of the Bible that you've got to get to. We see, turn to John 16. I think this is where Jesus lays out, this is what I'm going to be doing, and this is what he's talking about here. In John 16, he says, uh, just for sake of time, we're just going to jump straight to the text here, verse 12, where he says it. He says, I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he <clears throat> will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. So, some people say, well, he's talking about understanding of revelation. Of, of already stuff that's already been revealed. I don't think that's what he's talking about. The context is all about Jesus. Because in the verses preceding it, he's talking, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. What, what truth are we talking about? I'm going to go away. And when I go, I'm going to send the helper. Because what are we going to do? I'm going to go and he's going to come because they don't believe in me. He's going to convict them concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me concerning judgment because the rule of this world has been judged. By who? By me. This is all about Christ. And then he says, I have many more things to say to you. About what? About me. But you can't bear them now. You're not ready for this, so I'm going to send my helper, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so he's talking about understanding new revelation here. Belief in him. And he says in verse 12, I still have many things to say about myself. So this new revelation, not understanding of revelation already given is what he's talking about. New revelation. Jesus said it will be all the truth, meaning the totality of the new revelation and information that God intends to give. And the focus of that new revelation is Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes because his ministry is all about shining the spotlight on Christ. Christ. 
And this is the stewardship that Paul is referring to. He and some of the other apostles, they were to receive from the Holy Spirit all the truth by which the New Testament would then live by. And this is one of the verses that shows that God is not giving new revelation today because his apostles has all, he has already given to his apostles all the truth that he intends to give to his church. And he's given it through the apostles. And this is why one of the marks of a cult is they add to the word of God. They say they got new revelation. No, no. The Spirit has already guided his apostles into all the truth. Paul understood that understood his responsibility was then to make the word of God fully known. The revelation that God gives, he's now going to put it here, right here, so that you can know everything that you need to know for life and for godliness. Interestingly, Apostle Peter, he confirms this was their understanding of this unique stewardship. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at what he says here about Paul's writings. Right? They're contemporaries. They're both alive at the same time. Paul's writing these epistles to the churches. And this is, this is what Peter says. Imagine you know, how humble God must have made Peter. He walked with Jesus. He was the leader of the apostles. And Paul's writing all this stuff. And it's scripture, he says. And Peter isn't going, oh, it should be me. He gets to write some, but not the amount that Paul did. Paul was persecuting the church. Peter walked with Jesus. Humility. Humility, friends, must characterize our ministry. That's how you'll have joy in it. Otherwise, you'll be grinding your teeth. Don't they see how much I'm doing? Don't they see how much I'm doing? No, oh, look at the one who you're serving who should cast you into hell. But he's allowed you to serve him. Serve him humbly, and therefore you'll serve him joyfully. This is what Peter says about Paul. He says, our beloved, this is 2 Peter 3, 15. Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, right? Because they're his unfolding truth. Truth never before understood. That's why it's hard to understand. What? The Gentiles do. Oh, oh, I thought they were unclean. These are hard to understand. He says, which the ignorant and the unstable, they twist these things to their own destruction. And look at the end. As they do, what does he say there? The other scriptures. That's Paul's writings he's talking about. It's on par with the other scriptures. That's the apostle Peter. They knew what was going on. They knew they were writing God's Word. They didn't need some councils hundreds of years later to decide what God's Word was. That's the accusation against the Bible. These councils of men came together and said, this is Scripture, this is not. This is Scripture, this is not. As if they were painting a divine Jesus into so they could have control and power over the populace. No, no, the apostles knew they were writing Scriptures. And it's self-revelatory, it's self-vindicating. The, the church knew the scriptures. They were saying, this letter is amazing. This isn't Paul's words. This is God's word. That's what was unfolding. And it was unfolding even in the first century. Paul's assignment was to complete the word of God. This, he says, was his stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. And to this task, Paul said, I'll be faithful. He'll still gladly suffer for Christ in the process. He knows he shouldn't be alive. He knows what he was. He was once a man driven by hatred. He presided over the persecution, the prosecution, the imprisonment, the death of Christians. He had blood on, of believers on his hands. That's why he called himself the chief of sinners. God chose this man to be the one to make his word about Christ fully known and to preach his gospel of grace. Who better knew the grace of God than Paul? Christ doesn't care how much you've sinned. He doesn't care how much... Uh, how far you've gone, how deep you've gone into your sin. If he can use a sinner like Paul, he can use you. If Paul can faithfully serve God and rejoice, even when it meant suffering, God can enable you to do the same and to serve Christ's body faithfully. The third way seeing the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ compels you to serve is to declare Christ's glory powerfully. Declare Christ's glory powerfully. 
It's in verse 27 where Paul makes clear that the gospel centers around the revelation of Christ and his glory. And he defines the word of God. He is tasked by God to make known as, look at verse 26, he calls it the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So first, first we see the focus of the gospel. What's the focus of the gospel? It's Christ. The focus of the gospel is Christ. It's not people need the Lord. It's not He's so broken and bad, we need to rescue him. No, the purpose and the focus of the gospel is Christ. Christ is at the center. That's why the gospel is glorious, because Christ is at the center of it. Paul calls that which God is making known, he calls it a mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations. And he's namely think, thinking of the Old Testament era and people prior to the coming of Christ. He says, but now. Paul means at the time of the New Testament, after Christ's coming, and all the way up until the present day, now, right? Now, this truth has been manifested to his saints. And this divine revelation given to Paul, it has one overarching point. Christ. He says, God willed to make known the glory of Christ. That's what he's saying. All the other words are just describing this. The riches and all that is describing his glory. But what he's making known is the glory of Christ. Paul is saying that Christ, who he is, what he did, Christ is the main subject matter of this new revelation that God has given to the apostles and would become the New Testament scriptures and it would bring to completion God's revelation to man. The whole point of this new revelation that makes up the New Testament, it's the revelation of the glory of Christ. And Paul says much the same thing in Romans 16. If you jump over there, Romans 16, verse 25. He says in 16, 25, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, meaning the Old Testament, according to the commandment of the eternal God, it's been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith. He's saying the same thing. He says, the gospel is the preaching of Jesus Christ. What he did, who he is. The revelation that Paul received, it's divine insight into the person and the work of Christ. Christ is the gospel. In Colossians, Paul simply adds to it the glory of Christ. So the summation of the revelation that he's talking about here is Christ. And the goal of this revelation, make it known. Make known the glory of Christ. His saving glory, his, his gracious mercy towards sinners. Make it known. He's coming. He's going to judge you. Everything that he did pointed to him being God. Make it known. Make it known. This is news we all need to hear. He's coming. Are you ready? Now, Paul chooses, secondly, to really highlight the greatness of the glory of Christ. He doesn't just say the glory of Christ, does he? When he's referring to it, he amplifies it. He calls it, he will to make known what is the riches of the glory of Christ. And he equates the glory of Christ with abounding wealth. His glory abounds. It overflows. The per, his person, his work, the glorious person and work of Christ, he's the image of the invisible God he just got done saying in verse 15. He's the firstborn of all creation. He's everything God is. He images, he reflects, he radiates all that God is. There's nothing in God that's not found in Christ. His glory abounds. This glorious person, he reconciled us by his death. He exhibited infinite love and justice and pity and mercy and power towards you. And when he died, he conquered the bonds of death. He sat down at the right hand of God. This is the essence of what Paul revealed to fill up to the fullness the word of God. And Paul is willing to suffer if necessary to fulfill his stewardship, to reveal this glorious Christ. 
Everything else in this world is garbage. It's garbage compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. No worldly accomplishments, no accolades, no treasures can compare to knowing Him and serving Him. There's no one like Him. Don't waste your life on these lesser pursuits that are destined to pass away. They'll only leave you disappointed and disillusioned and dissatisfied. Not even suffering in prison could diminish this joy that Paul had in serving this glorious Christ. Oh, do you see his glorious person? Do you understand what he did for you? If you do, you can't help but make him known and declare the riches of his glory to others. See, not only must we declare Christ's glory faithfully, but we, like Paul, must preach Christ's hope confidently. That's the fourth application. Preach Christ's hope confidently. Paul says that this glorious supreme and sufficient Christ who has reconciled us completely through his death, he also guarantees an eternal glory for his people. He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So first in this phrase, Christ in you. He's referring to your salvation here. This glorious Christ by the Holy Spirit, he takes up permanent residence in all believers. It was a part of the new covenant that God made with his people. And with this new covenant came the New Testament, which was where he chose to reveal this glorious truth. All God's people, both Jews and Gentiles alike, they are now permanently indwelt by Christ's Spirit. Jesus said this in John 14, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My Father will love it, and we will come to him and make our abode in him. In Romans 8, 9 and 10, however, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. So to have Christ in you is to have Christ as your freeing, renewing, liberating, transforming Savior. And the proof that Christ is in you is that he's freed you. He's changed you. He's renewed you. This is the result of what Paul says in verse 22, about reconciliation. And it's also the reason why he goes on to say in verses 28 and 29, why he matures you and completes you. It's because Christ is in you. But notice that Paul makes it clear that the end and the goal of the gospel is not this life only. It's about eternal glory. He says, Christ in you, secondly, the hope of glory. And Paul had this on his mind when he first started writing this letter. Back in, chapter one, back in verse 5 of chapter 1, he gives thanks for the Colossians' faith in, in Christ and love for the saints. And he says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. See, the gospel is about what's coming. You need to settle matters with God now because there's something coming. It's either judgment or glory. Which is it going to be, Sinner. Judgment or glory? It's so necessary that we realize as Christians that the end and the goal of the gospel is not this life. Christ does many amazing things for us in this life. He gives us many good things to enjoy in this life. But our best life is not now. What a horrible thing to preach from any pulpit that your best life is now. They have no understanding of the gospel. The gospel is not about now. The gospel is about eternal glory. The best is yet to come. Paul says this over and over in his letters. Romans 5, 2, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Ephesians 1, 18, I pray your eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Romans 8, 18, I consider that these sufferings of this present time, the today, that's not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What's to come is better. 2 Corinthians 4.17, momentary light affliction is producing in us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. See, there is a glory guaranteed by Christ to all who believe in him. Christ in us is just the down payment. The glory, the real, full, and complete joy of Christ in us is coming how glorious it will be. The burden of your sin will be removed. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more sorrows. The infinite weight of this glory 
to come. It makes everything that you experience in this life, be it suffering or even joyful, utterly small and insignificant. You are going to look back on whatever experiences you have had in serving Christ one day from your vantage point in eternity, and you know what you're going to do? You're going to shake your head and just smile. Man, I thought that was once so big. It's just absolutely nothing compared to what I have now. Nothing. The day is coming when we need to, conf- this day is coming, and so we need to confidently encourage one another with this glorious hope such that this passing world will get less and less and less of a grip on us so that we will serve the supreme and glorious Christ and will serve Him joyfully and faithfully all our days. You won't be compelled to do that, though, without seeing the glorious supremacy and the complete sufficiency of Christ. Let's pray. Father, don't let this be just another Sunday. Don't let this be just another sermon. You are all that we have heard, and much, much more, and we need to be awakened. We need to be moved. We need to be shaken. We will be held accountable for what we have heard here today. And so, Spirit of God, bring to bear upon us the weight of your glory such that it compels us to share joyfully in your afflictions and to serve your people faithfully. Show us your glory so that we can't help but declare it. Let us see this world in light of our future glory so that we will not grow weary or fall asleep or not be found faithfully, but instead will be found faithfully laboring in the fields that are ripe for harvest. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand?